Tonight's event was, uh, is, is the inaugural event in our season of um, events around the Big Read. And um, this year, our Big Read title is uh, Dina Mendes to The Beautiful Things That Heaven Bears. Um, for those of you who haven't read it, it's a novel about an Ethiopian immigrant who um, moves to Washington, D.C. and becomes a shopkeeper in a rapidly gentrifying neighborhood called Logan Circle, um, and he becomes involved, involved with one of the um, white gentrifiers, uh, and it does not end quite happily for him, but it's a wonderful book, and its themes are um, sort of relevant to not just Washington, D.C., but to the rest of the country and, and I think to the rest of the world. And so we are using those themes as the occasion for tonight's discussion. Um, I should also say that whenever I go to um, literary events uptown uh, where, where my novel is set, those events always end up being uh, discussions about gentrification. We, we, um, we start out talking about books and end up talking about real estate. And I thought, <laughs> why, why not just dispense with the formality and have a discussion about gentrification? So thank you all for coming out. Um, before I go any further, I should also say that um, tonight's event as part of the Big Read is supported by the National Endowment for the Arts and by Arts Midwest, and we are grateful for their support. Now to introduce our, our esteemed panel. Angela Flournoy is a graduate of the Iowa Writers Workshop, her debut novel. The Turner House was a finalist for the National Book Award and for the Center for Fiction's first novel prize. Her work has appeared in the Paris Review, the New, uh, the New Republic, and elsewhere. Delighted to have Angela back at the center. D.W. Gibson is the author of Not Working, People Talk About Losing a Job and Finding Their Way in Today's Changing Economy. His work has appeared in Harper's, New York Magazine, Salon, and other leading periodicals. He's director of Writers, Oh My, at Leddig House in the Hudson Valley. His latest book is The Edge Becomes the Center, an oral history of gentrification in the 21st century. He is also a contributor and co-host to the There Goes the Neighborhood podcast, which you can hear on um, NPR. Suleiman Osman is Associate Professor of American Studies at George Washington University. He is the author of The Invention of Brownstone Brooklyn, Gentrification and the Search for Authenticity in Post-War New York City. He grew up in Park Slope, Brooklyn, and now lives in Washington, D.C. And Sunil Yapa holds a BA in Economic Geography from Penn State and an MFA from Hunter College. The recipient of numerous scholarships and awards, his writing has been published in American Short Fiction, Hyphen, The Totten, The Tottenville Review, and elsewhere. His debut novel, Your Heart is a Muscle the Size of a Fist, was published earlier this year to wide acclaim. It, dramat it dramatizes the massive protest at the 1999. World Trade Organization meeting in Seattle. Um, so please welcome our distinguished panel. I'm, I'm going to start by um, reading a short passage from, from D.W.'s book. In this passage, um, a woman named Paula Siegel, who is the founder of an organization called 596, 596 Acres, uh, which helps communities um, gain access to unused um, land in their neighborhoods. And here she is talking. I don't use this word gentrification. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't describe anything in the world. It's a noun, right? So you should be able to point to something in the world. It's a nebulous word that has to do with the movement of capital and increased land work. But as far as dealing with the work on the ground day to day, the issues are about displacement and about people's quality of life and about the places they live. That kind of expresses one of the challenges in talking about gentrification, which is that it is this big nebulous subject. So I want to just begin by inviting the panel to talk about one aspect of it, one story, one anecdote, one thing that they've heard or seen. Um, it could even be the thing that, that prompted you to write your, write your books. Um, so if, if we could start with Angela, just one thing. So um, I, I think the, the, the thing that probably most ties in from, uh, with gentrification for my book 
was actually the thing that was the beginning of me thinking about my book, uh, like maybe a year before I was ready to actually start writing it. And that is um, just the, in 2009, the state of my grandmother's home on the east side of Detroit, which um, was a place that had uh, been in my family for 40 years and my um, grandparents had worked really hard to maintain and it was still in great condition in 2009, but no one wanted to live in it because the neighborhood was, um, I guess, to the people, to my relatives who lived there, it become unlivable and that wasn't just because of like a high crime rate that had been a reality since the 80s, but it had become a, a situation where the city had decided that they didn't deserve services. So trash wasn't being picked up as frequently. They had a lot of um, street lights that were not being replaced couldn't get your mail, mail on time anymore, so it started to feel like a place where people were being starved out, yeah. and um, that bothered me, and that was really the, the genesis of the novel in a lot of ways. Um, a couple things, I mean, one, uh, you know, I've lived in New York for 20 years, and I moved here in 1995 when Times Square was under scaffolding, and I kind of feel like I arrived just as something was ending and something else was starting, uh, so I've always been sort of curious about that. Um, but uh, there's one thing that always sort of stands out in my mind when I think about sort of the implications of gentrification. And uh, it goes back to this guy I interviewed for the book named Raul, who grew up uh, on, in the East Village, Lower East Side, and uh, during the uh, 70s and 80s. And I talked to him for several days and I tried to get him to, you know, he kept saying, it's so different, New York's so different, it's changed, it's changed. And I kept trying to get him to really zero in on that and say how it has changed and, and how he would quantify that. And finally, a light bulb went off for him one day and he said, you know, one day we went out to the street, uh, we went to the stoop where we always sat, me and my friends, and they'd put spikes up on the little wall so we could sit there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then everything was different. And I think it just goes to show how something so finite, something so um, uh, 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 specific uh, can have such implications for how someone sort of interacts with their, with their neighborhood. Okay. When you mentioned your quote, I thought it would be fun maybe to bring in a quote. Uh, and uh, you can try to guess what year it's from. So I'll read it. It's a New York Times article. And it's describing the French Quarter in Greenwich Village um, during, the, during this year. Um, and I'll just do little p bits and pieces of it. Uh, the French Quarter has been overrun by irresponsible, effervescent young art students, architects, and writers. There is in Greenwich Village, the most ardent of these posers, uh, hail from Prioria and Oshkosh. Um, uh, uh, a, some, that's a little bit small here, sorry. Someday a, a, a sociologist will chart the invisible watershed which turns some of these acolytes of art towards New York and towards the Gulf. Um, it's, it's not difficult to foresee the consequences. The real estate boomer and the landlord will run amok in this quarter just as, they, as they've overspread Greenwich Village. Um, the French Quarter has suffered the fate of all such quarters. This has become a fad. So can anybody guess what year this is? 2016. Yeah. Nope. <laughs> a little earlier. <laughs> earlier. 1965. Earlier? 50s. 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 1922. 22. Oh, wow. That's pretty interesting. So these are really long-standing debates in cities. It's interesting, yeah. Um, and obviously gentrification has changed. This was before the even gentrification was a term. It was coined in the 60s by a London sociologist. Didn't become a term that was used in the U.S. until the late 1970s. Um, and it's interesting for me, as I think about this, I grew up in New York City. I'm not going to position myself as a, you know, authentic New Yorker at all. I have no zero street cred. <laughs> but I did grow up in New York. I grew up in the Lower East Side in the 1970s, moved to uh, Columbia Street south of Avenue D, moved to Brooklyn in the 1980s. Um, and already by the 1990s, I was beginning to feel that the city I knew was changing. That's sort of way hard to put your finger on it that he was describing with Raul. Um, and at the same time, the, I've sort of begun to realize, grapple with two ways of knowing the city, my own personal memory and then historical memory, and how sometimes they don't even match up, mm -hmm. and how the city changed, uh, grappling with accepting that the city changes, um, that there are people now for whom the city have lived in Park Slope for 20 years, and they arrived in the 1990s, and in some ways they have claim to Park Slope in a way I don't. Um, and I think gentrification, what's so interesting about gentrification is because it's linked to claims to placemaking, 
that one of the things that's so content contentious is how people grapple over the meanings of places. And so it's a, I've, the book for me was just fascinating to write about a place that I grew up, but have to step back from it and begin to have different ways of knowing a place. Yeah, so, so both of you, well, so I wrote a book about protesting and about globalization, so I'm kind of not really uh, a gentrification expert, but two of the things that you just said really speak to what I wrote about. One is um, how much are, I think part of gentrification is how much our public space has changed and how much our, uh, in cities, our ability to, what some people would call contact, our ability to interact outside of our natural networks, um, across class lines, across race lines, and we've, we've lost public space and public space has become commodified and it's another process of capital. And so writing about a protest, one of the things that was immediately obvious to me was h how do we negotiate space in a city and who owns a space? And so w when a space is private, like Zuccotti Park, and, it, it, and we have a, try to have a protest there or an uh, expression of public speech, it's on private property all of a sudden. And we've lost a lot of the, I think through gentrification we've lost, and through commodification, we've lost a lot of the spaces that used to exist in cities where people um, across class and across race, um, across you know, all sorts of divides were able to interact. And I can talk more about that later, about, about the power of that. But, but one of the things that was so amazing about the WTO protest when I investigated it was people taking back the city. And there was a real, one of the most empowering senses of that protest for people was reclaiming the city. And it's a funny thing to think, well, why did you have to reclaim your own city? Who were you reclaiming it from? Well, and that leads to a, uh, a related topic with bo both of your anecdotes dealt with displacement, with, um, with the, I mean, in, in your case, the, the city was no longer providing services. So that, that was kind of saying, like, move on, we're done with you. And, and, and just the simple act of putting those spikes on that, on that is saying, we don't want you sitting here anymore. And that, that brings up your notion of public space and where, where you can interact. Um, I, I wonder, um, I wonder also about this idea of technology and what, what role technology might have to play in gentrification. Particularly, I, I'm thinking of, um, of the role of social media and, and do people really need public space as much as they do? Do people, do people really just want a, a glass box where they can go log on to Facebook and, and Twitter and, and interact? So the question is, and also technology, in your book, the, the guys who are selling and developing apartments. They're talking about the speed with which they can do this now that they have this technology. So is this an e e e evolution of an old problem, or has technology sort of changed the game? Can I jump on that real yeah, quick? Yeah, go right I, ahead. I, I, don't, I, I think that it's a bit of an illusion that we live in an ever more connected um, time. I, I, I actually think that we're more and more isolated. And I think, in particular, I mean, I'm a particularly alienated person, but in particular, uh, like I said, we don't, you know, the people on my Facebook feed, it, that's great that they're all around the world, but they're pretty much from my class, with my education, with my similar experience. I don't even have Republicans in my Facebook feed. I mean, how, I mean, honestly, I, my mind is circulating in the same network of similar minds. And, and, and I think that, that that's not a small point. One of the things we lose um, when we lose public space and when we gentrify neighborhoods, one of the profound things we lose is the sort of fertility of difference, if you could say that. There's something absolutely, you know, fertile ground is people that are different than you and the lightning bolts of creativity that can cross, those, cross that. And so for me, I, I think we're more isolated and I think we lose a lot of creativity and we lose a lot of difference, obviously. Yeah, I mean, I would piggyback on that because um, I think one of the sort of big narratives for New York City through various generations has been uh, uh, we have to be in each other's faces. We share the city together. We're on the subway together. We're on the street together. We have to look into each other's eyes. This doesn't happen in L.A. You're in your car. You're doing your thing. But in New York, you have to be in each other's faces. And that's, that's less and less true as time goes on because we can be more and more in our world. And so when the new coffee shop opens in Crown Heights, it will be filled with people, 
but they'll all be in their own world they're, or the bar. They'll just be there with their computer or their phone doing their thing. And so you're still coming to share a physical space together, but you're not uh, using it together, which is interesting. And then it starts to feel like prerequisites for anybody looking in from the street to get into that place. There's the aesthetics of who it feels warm and inviting to, and it feels like I've got to have a laptop and uh, you know big Boss headphones to get in there. Uh, and so in, in very diff, uh, uh, in sort of a multiplicity of inter, sort of tangled ways, I think um, uh, technology plays a big part in how, uh, how much we do interact with each other. And, and that's important because uh, uh, proximity matters when you're talking about trying to um, keep some fabric of a street or a neighborhood or a block or a building together. Proximity matters a lot. <coughs> Angela, you're from you're from LA. Mm -hmm. uh, do you find that to be the case about New York? That, that it is much more. You have much more um, engagement with people on a daily basis here, or is that less? Um, I, I think that you might have actual physical proximity to more people on a daily basis, but uh, quality, I'm not sure. Um, for me, as a fiction writer, sure, I overhear people. That's useful to me on the train. But there um, absolutely are a way I was noticing. On the, I was on the G on the way here. Everyone is in their device. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not necessarily that you're just um, having these moments of like spontaneous interaction with people. Um, it seems like a good time to, to bring up um, Sarah Schulman's idea of the gentrification of the mind mm -hmm. in, in her book, where, where she talks particularly about about how the, the AIDS crisis, but I think that the idea is, is applicable across other um, minorities, other um, disenfranchised groups who um, find that, there are, that they are pushed to the edge culturally by gentrification, both physically and in terms of participating in the cultural discussion. You have thoughts on that? Is, is it both a physical, um, Removal and also a um, sort of cultural removal as well. I yeah, absolutely. I, I think that we. Um, I mean, obviously, when people are literally displaced from their home, that's a serious issue. But uh, sometimes I think we fixate on that. We miss the people who are displaced in a more figurative way. Uh, I spent a lot of time last few months uh, hanging out with a woman named Trancalina from Pueblo, Mexico, who lives on Bedford Avenue and North Sixth in Williamsburg. She's been living there for twenty-five years. Um, she has a rent-stabilized apartment. And her landlord did everything he could to get her out. Uh, he changed the lock on the building, stopped collecting her rent, uh, started renovating the halls so that the building became unsafe. The city said, you've got to leave Trinkling, that's too unsafe here. She had to go live with her nephew in Coney Island. Uh, when she finally won uh, in court, after two years, the right to get back into her apartment, she discovered that the landlord had already rented it out to somebody else and renovated it, had to get that person out. She's back in it now, and the, and the landlord's trying to get her out again. She talks about how there used to be so many Mexicans in the neighborhood, and they all knew each other in the building. And now whenever she sees other Mexicans, they're just coming to Williamsburg to work in the bars, or they're mopping the floor in her building, and they see her, and they're like, what are you doing here? You don't, you don't live here, do you? Um, she's so utterly isolated. The culture in the whole world that she had spent 25 years building up with the other families in that building is gone. So she's managed to stay in place. She hasn't been displaced, literally speaking. She has her apartment, but she's an alien in that world. And she has all kinds of issues with depression and she can't sleep uh, because she is, uh, uh, she's a foreigner in her own community. And I think that that is a widespread phenomenon that a lot of uh, people, working class people, um, uh, uh, experience, particularly people, brown and black people who have been already marginalized uh, in terms of class structure. And that, and that links up with um, immigration's role in, in, uh, in this. Um, pe people who come in from other countries often end up living in the, in the least desirable parts of, of the city, and then they still manage to establish communities there and, yeah. and make relationships there, and then they're, as the city develops, they're forced to move out. Um, so, that, I mean, that's very much a theme of, um, of the Dino's book. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change tack a little bit. I want to read a, a passage from your book, Suleiman. Um, this is a discussion of, of the brownstones when they were being erected uh, in, a, in the late 18th century. Right. While they would later be viewed as authentic, contemporaries dismissed brownstones as modern and artificial, foreshadowing such 
foreshadowing post-World War II broadsides against urban renewal and suburban architecture, critics in the 19th century decried the mechanical, dehumanizing monotony of brownstone rows. When one has seen one house, he has seen them all, wrote one writer. The same everlasting high stoops and gloomy brownstone fronts, the same number of holes punched precisely in the same places. And it's interesting to note, of course, that those, those are the, some of the criticisms that are leveled at the buildings that are being put up as part of gentrifying cities, these glass towers or the McMansions out, out in the suburbs. And so um, my question is, is this just a cycle? How much of this is, is personal taste? I mean, is it, is it a generational well, thing? I could, yeah, the point I was, uh, there is I'm, I'm sort of making is not to fixate on the specific building type as being more, let's say, authentic or more historic than right. other ones. That buildings over time become repositories of memory. and They develop a pattern with age. So even the high-rise public housing project that seemingly has no ornamentation can become a place with time as it's infused with memory uh, so the, I think in this, when people began to juxta juxtapose the authenticity of a brownstone as opposed to the placelessness of a high-rise project, right. um, that that's not really what makes places. And, pla and one of the reasons we have to think about preserving places, a variety of places, even your um, mall, your strip mall in, um, Boston, in Los Angeles, right, in some ways, is how places become repositories. Mm -hmm. That's why I think. Uh, the shoot the humanities or fiction the fiction captures that so well. The mm -hmm. books here, um, so I think with gentrification, I was going to say also to answer the other question. I think there are a couple ways you can think about it, about the pros and cons of it. And one is the type of utilitarian, very who are the winners, who are the losers, how many people are displaced, how many people sell their houses, mm -hmm. like a very sort of math oriented. Um, you know, what are the pluses and minuses? Who people? You know, and it's of course it's nuanced in that way. Then there's kind of a bigger question, which is more on the level of, is it fair? You know, is it just? And that's a kind of a bigger question. You know, do, yes, something feels off. And there's a lot of people who, theor who theorize what it means to have a just city. But what is the Brooklyn or what is the Manhattan that we want? And how do we ha keep that on the ground? Um, without necessarily counting how many people were displaced and how many people made a killing and moved to South mm -hmm. Carolina. It's kind of missing the point. Um, and I think that's where the kind of humanity steps in as you begin to think about what does it mean to have a just city and how do we achieve that? And I think there's a feeling among people, both people moving in and people who are there, that somehow what we're seeing on the ground is not matching what we want. And that's an interesting, more difficult question in some ways, right? It's not fair to say, how do you give people the right to stay put and people also the right to move? It's not fair to say, now the city's getting good, now this, now this place is getting nicer facilities, you can't live here anymore. And at the same time, it's also not fair to say there are parts of the city that you can't move in, right? And so the, how do you, what, what does it mean for us? And that's what I think would be an interesting, fascinating conversation. What is a just city? Who would who would make those decisions? How would we who would be able to decide what is just? Who would be able to, to um, make those I th changes? I think one of the things characteristics of a just city. And this is like there's a book, the Just City. But it's like um, cities that are democratic can have citizen engagement and involvement in decision making. Mm -hmm. You know, it can't be the only characteristic of it, but you know, because sometimes people can decide. A homeowners association can decide not nice things. But I mean, we think people want equity, they want diversity. This is Susan Feinstein, so I'm quoting her. But also some sort of sense of people, not people from the outside changing Brooklyn, but that people on the ground in Brooklyn have some say in the trajectory, trajectory of Brooklyn. Yeah. And I think that's part of, part of it. Even people who don't have a lot of power also have, you know, so, mm -hmm. You know, so I think we, I, I, I totally agree with DW that we can get caught up in sort of trying to count, okay, on this block, how many people were actually forced to leave, how many people leave, left on their own, how many people are homeowners, how many, and that's kind of missing the big picture of what people feel is wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Isn't there some sense, too, of, of a just city, but also a vibrant city? 
And why did we all come to New York? And what is the disappointment we feel? It's not just that we have to pay a lot in rent. Right. It's that there, there, there was this idea of New York, and I, I think it's true, of, as being a very fertile ground for creativity. And I think part of gentrification, and Sarah Schulman talks about this in her book, the gentrification, uh, her book's not called The Gentrification of the Mind, but one of the chapters, um, that a lot of the people coming in, it, to pay that high rent, you have to be, you're not an out of work artist. Let's just put it, that, that's one of the things that's happening, right? right. So you, 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 this is a generalization, but subscribing to, uh, and, and a relationship to the status quo and to sort of um, the commodification culture and the profit culture, that's very different than the communities that were there before. And so, um, I mean, there's a lot of ways to generalize what I just said, but I right. think I think that when I read that, that gets at some of the sort of intangible of what's missing from both a just city and sort of a vibrant, creative city. And I'll take the liberty of generalizing what you just said. I think it's a matter of uh, uh, New York City becoming less and less a place where people make art and more a place where they buy art. Mm, right. Consumption. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're gonna, we're gonna. I'm not gonna um, stage this discussion for too much longer because I want to give the audience a chance to interact with you. I mean, what, we want to discuss this this topic, but I'm gonna um, just. I had two other passages that I wanted to read out just from each of your books. Angela, I'm full of suspense. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this this is near the start of the Turner House. So the Turner House is this um, house in Detroit where the 13 children have grown up. The father has passed away, the mother is ailing, and they're trying to d decide what to do with the house, which um, there's $40,000 left on the mortgage, but the house is only worth $4,000. So they're d having a family meeting to discuss this. Um, so this little passage. Um, yeah, Nettie added. We sell it today, and in 10 years, Donald Trump or somebody will buy it. Build a, build a townhouse and sell it to some white folks for 200 grand. Everyone faces stricken acknowledged the truth in this. That's the way the east side is going to go eventually, Russell said. He balanced precariously on the bar stool. It was a bit too narrow for his behind. People are just walking away from their houses, and the city's making it too hard for folks to buy them, talking about you have to pay the back taxes and what all else. Even on empty lots. They should be happy, happy somebody wants to mow the grass. But let some millionaire offer to buy a whole bunch of lots at once, Troy said, and all of a sudden the city will start cutting deals for them. Pennies on the dollar, I bet you anything. Well, for one thing, how do you feel now that, that Trump is the... Uh, oh, man. <laughs> um, um, is the weirdly, like, sadly, uh, kind of like prescient in a lot of ways. One, I wrote that, like, that was one of the... I wrote that maybe in like 2010. But um, the second part even more, so the second part about um, a millionaire being able, so in Detroit, the big challenge is if you owe taxes on your house, even if you get like some sort of, like say you, you've been, it's, you paid it off and you own the house, but you owe property taxes, the city makes it, they, they in theory will cut deals with you. They have a program, but like nobody knows about this program. Of course, like the elderly people in these homes are not getting like leaflets in the mail about these programs. And they make it very hard um, to negotiate. And um, it's only, I think two years ago, the, the new mayor, Mayor Duggan, who's kind of the mayor because the city is still overseen by the state and we see how successful they are at overseeing things in Flint, Michigan. But um, they, um, they, finally, after like 20 years of not reevaluating their property tax code, looked at it and was like, oh yeah, we need to change this because nothing is worth as much as we, we thought it was worth. So it's not as hard as it was, but what happens is that people walk away from their houses because they can't pay the property taxes. Then the other thing that happens is that the city auctions homes that people owe too many pro back property taxes on, even when the people are still in the home. Yeah. And so you have people who are like, I bought a house for $1,000, and then they have been immediately have to evict someone. Um, there was like an infuriating story about this, I believe in the Washington Post, like two years ago, which is a young man, um, I believe from New York, um, bought a house at an auction for, I think, like $1,500, found out like a little black lady was living in there, and she was like, all right, I'll cut you a deal. I'll buy my house back for you, from you for three thousand dollars, and the the end of the article is him saying, "Well, I feel like I just got a raw deal." 
He like helps an old lady stay in her home. And there are tons of houses, you know, you just can't, can't have this one. But um, so one thing I was thinking about when we were talking about um, having a sort of a, like a just city and having a city that's vibrant and artistic um, is the role, um, I just like can't think of these things and not think of the role that like is specifically in a lot of a post-war northern cities that institutionalized racism has played mm -hmm. in things being like in the very fabric of even people who own homes, uh, people of color who own homes, they started with terrible loans. They started not being able to get the interest rate that they were entitled to given their credit score and their income. So they were already sort of in a very vulnerable state to um, be taken advantage of um, by people like the fictional Ephraim in your book, um, which does anyone, I feel like everyone in New York probably read that chapter. <laughs> um, but, um, but yeah, so I think that um, it's one thing that I think about a lot is the way that um, in addition to it being something that is a challenge because everyone should have a right to live where they want to live, it's a challenge if we're not honest about Everyone wants to live in a diverse population, but there's plenty of studies that have shown that like, when a population of people of color in a community are more than 10%, white people start to get nervous. It's a little bit too diverse for their liking. Yeah. And that is a problem. If you're moving into a neighborhood that's 80% of color, what are, you, what are you hoping happens? You're mm -hmm. either going to have to stop being nervous or you're going to be part of the problem and you're gonna be like hoping that in a couple of years it doesn't look the way it looks. Um, and I think that's something that people have to reckon with. Um, and it, when we talk again about like the way that that influences culture, it absolutely influences education because people similarly don't want to send their kids to schools where the numbers are not the way that they like, even if the school is performing in a way that ostensibly should be fine. And, and so redlining was a practice that went on for, for many years. And the mm -hmm. question is, is is gentrification now a kind of de facto redlining for, for a lot of people? Um, so, um, recently the, the mayor introduced new uh, new housing plan. Um, I wonder if um, DWU and, and uh, Suleiman would, would, have you uh, studied the plan? Do you think it's effective? Do you think I it's see the plan in my sleep at night in bed, and so I need to stop studying it. Um, I mean, look, in broad strokes, there are good things happening in terms of uh, what Mayor de Blasio wants to do. But you know, when you get into the weeds, it gets dicey. And so um, the key point with regards to East New York, the key point is that um, you know, they're talking about 6,000 new units and trying to make a big portion, about 2,000 of those affordable units. So the question becomes how we're defining affordability. And all of this, not to get too into the weeds, but uh, all of this is defined by the average median income, right? Which is in this city defined by the five boroughs and some outer suburban areas. So we get to a number of about $71,000, $72,000 a year is the medium income. The medium income in East New York is $31,000 a year. So unless they make that zoning plan, they have not done this yet, unless they make the affordable, affordability levels uh, in that plan geared toward people making $31,000 a year, then it's not going to truly be affordable for the people that are living there now. And they're not going to be able to stay in their homes. So we either need to bring those, you can do two, one or two things. You can bring those rates, those, those AMI levels, those average medium income levels down for East New York to be appropriate with people that are living there. Or you can raise wages and give them more money in their pocket. But uh, so I think that's the fundamental problem there. I don't have a problem with density. I think that we have more people coming to the city. We do need to build. Uh, you can you can build more dense housing. That's that that can happen. Uh, but uh, 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 it, it's just um, the levels, the the percentages that they're promising now for people that make money at that level uh, are not significant enough. And it's going to be a small portion of the community that is East New York right now that's going to get to stay there. Do you have any thoughts on it? No? Okay. So um, at this point, I'm going to throw it open to questions. Anybody have a question for the panel? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, I'm wondering what you all think in terms of uh, talking about gentrification. Usually, you just think Brooklyn. But I was thinking about like Manila, Lagos, or like you know, Mega City. Ten, I think it's ten million. So I was just kind of wondering. I was in Manila recently. Gentrification is like burning down squatter encampments and then putting up a mall. So it just like happens like that. So I was just kind of wondering what you might think about that in terms of 
compare and contrast? So no, I didn't get a chance to read the, the passage from your novel that I'd highlighted, but it kind of deals with that. I wonder if you'd... Uh, I don't know what passage that it. is. It was, it's about the, the guy from the... The delegate from the Sri Lanka uh -huh. and, and the difficulties he faces in trying to bring his mission. But anyway, if you would answer the general Yeah, question. sure. I mean, I, I mean, there's issues of displacement and dispossession, I mean, all over the world. And, and, and it's one of the primary forces of capitalism is to dispossess people of their land. I mean, how many times has it happened in this country? And who, and, and I hate to be reductive, but who suffers from that? It's the most vulnerable of populations. So clearing slums um, to put up a mall is, is like kind of business as usual, unfortunately. Um, I think one of the things that really interests me is that is that it's business as usual, but it's not inevitable. It's not a natural process, right? It, it's, there's certain policies that encourage that happening. So the, even the growth of slums or the growth of the mega cities that we've seen all over the third world, I mean, that's encouraged by economic policies and, and specifically, let's say, in Mexico City, NAFTA had a lot to do with that, you know, um, undercutting the ability of farmers to make a living farming in the countryside by bringing in a lot of cheap corn, American corn, led to people having to leave the countryside and go to the city. So that's, a, a, that, those kind of supposed free trade agreements are a, a, wherein we bring subsidized rice and corn into places, you know, it happened in Haiti too, it's happened all over the world are a big reason why we've seen a huge growth of mega cities and, and you know, slums, yeah. I think, yeah, to add to that, that uh, to supplement that, I, I think there's some of the interesting new scholarship in gentrification is looking, you know, gentrification's gone global, and looking at post-Soviet, post-communist cities, mm -hmm. gentrification, and gentrification in the global south. The only thing, a little bit with the terminology, would might be a little bit that's just a big debate, is how expansive has the term gentrification come. Mm -hmm. So it's just clearing, f clearing um, favelas to build stadiums. Is that just old-fashioned slum clearance? And does gentrification, or that could be outdated. Does gentrification have to involve some sort of conversion of the existing? So is gentrification more the favela, favela tourism outside Rio and the you know, wealthy people actually moving into favelas? Um, but on the other hand, some people, as he's pointing out, this is just about cap. When we're talking about capital, is there that much difference? Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that's some interesting stuff. Is just not just look at Amsterdam, New York, and but start to look at Mexico City, Manila, and then um, Eastern Europe. It's really interesting. Eastern Europe, Sao Paulo, Sao Paulo uh, Bangalore, yeah. India. I, I think that. Um, uh, you know, the globalization is is a is a major factor because when Ruth Glass coined it in the '60s, it was different context, different time, right? And the, I think there are a lot of ways. I think it's dangerous to think about gentrification in a sort of pan way, in terms of the dynamics in Brooklyn are just like the ones in uh, Oakland or just like the ones in uh, South Los Angeles. Uh, every community, every block, for crying out loud, has its own dynamics, but. The flow of global capital is, in fact, one of the unifying factors, I think, in this sort of um, uh, uh, newer version, this global version of uh, gentrification. And I think that's one of the most insidious factors because then so often the people who own the land have never even set foot on the land. You know, they, I mean, they're, they're the groups investing now in New York are Swedish pension funds and Australian hedge funds and uh, the people who actually put forth the money to own that bagel shop or to own that apartment building never stepped foot in it. Um, and that's, that, that sort of segregation between the people who spend the most time in a neighborhood and the people who spend the most money in a neighborhood is really insidious, I think, and part of the global sort of picture of gentrification. There's some discussion of that term zombie urbanism, that they're now these, in places like Vancouver, yeah. Manhattan, these kind of ghostly skyscrapers that are half empty because they're just, they're just investments, right? Yeah. Just, so you go to Vancouver, beautiful city, but it has this ethereal feeling, this kind of glass emptiness of just buildings that are held in perpetuity, yeah. just yeah. as investments. No one lives in them. Yeah. Tower of money, almost. Literally. Yeah, yeah, something about the capital having no eradicating place or something, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I'm getting a sense of a Marxist bent here from the <laughs> something. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, just to create more discussion, are there positive aspects to gentrification? What about people who are able to, having invested wisely in some of this real estate, sell and retire very comfortably, or people who um, have benefited from improved services and 
flow of goods in their homes? And what about the eradication of poverty in some of these countries where the farmers have moved to the city? Aren't there some positive aspects to it? I'll just throw out there some people's, this is just my opinion, but some people point to the positive aspects of garment factories in Sri Lanka and, and you know, that aspect of globalization. And I have to say, forcing uh, people on the margins to compete for low wage jobs, which have no union benefits and strip environmental laws is, is, is not a positive in my opinion. Um, has life improved in some cities though because of the gentrification for some people? For, I mean, has general quality of life improved? Yeah, it does improve. The question is for who, right? Yeah, right. Because you, I, 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 I barely found, I really didn't find anyone. I talked to you know, people for three years and, and, and no one said, no, no, don't bring the better grocery store to the neighborhood. I mean, everybody wants fresh vegetables. Everybody wants uh, the good cup of coffee. Every, a lot of people want these things. Uh, it's a matter of uh, 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 bringing them to the neighborhood and letting the people that have been there through years of neglect, years of lack of services, uh, let them reap the benefits. That's the problem. So, uh, so if you walk the streets in the neighborhood, uh, there are more amenities. There are better uh, things for, for, for the people that are in that neighborhood. The fundamental problem is who are they better for? That's the problem. But yeah, there, there, there are some good aspects, absolutely, um, in terms of um, improving amenities. I mean, part of the you know, zoning plan for East New York involves finally getting East New York uh, Atlantic Avenue uh, cleaned up in terms of the roads. Terrible roadways, terrible sidewalks, unwalkable, uh, very bad road conditions. So finally, you know, better road conditions. That's a good thing, absolutely. So amenities and infrastructure can improve. But I, for think, who? I think it's about the power of the people that live in the neighborhood. And sometimes when you do have people coming in who do have more savvy about how to get things from the powers that be, you do find improved conditions in neighborhoods. Sure. Yeah, but the problem there is this people who have more savvy, not always, but a lot of times, um, to get things from the powers that be, also have more savvy on how to get out who they do not want in their neighborhood. Um, which is unfortunate, but it's a reality, and that is maybe spikes on a stoop, but that is also all of a sudden, like in D.C., um, the last sort of 16 years where you see the rise of Jump Out Boys, which is police officers who just like surround young black men on corners and try to get them off the corners and try to see what they have in their pockets, basically like stopping and frisk, but it's also quality of life. These are their new neighbors who are calling the police on children who have always been on this block mm -hmm. and saying they're suspicious. So the savvy, the problem is, is like usually there's like a moment where things, it's, it's a tipping point and unfortunately a lot of what happens is that the people who it could perhaps benefit also are the people who, the new people in the neighborhood don't necessarily think deserve to enjoy those benefits. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, this is and I'm just curious, like, do you have any ideas for what could be done to improve the situation so the city could be more livable for everyone? I mean, I mean you mentioned like the median, the median um, salary mm -hmm. should be based on the neighborhood, for example, like with de Blasio's plan. But that's just is there anything people in this room could do, people who live in, in gentrifying neighborhoods who are concerned about it? What, what, what could be done? Yeah, I mean, I think they, so you can talk about things in terms of policy and then interpersonal experiences, right? And policy, I mean, I have suggestions. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, uh, we won't spend too much time, but so uh, $2,700 if you're in a rent-stabilized apartment. The minute that rent hits $2,700, it's no longer rent-stabilized. And there are so many ways for the landlord to get to that $2,700. So that's a 1993 law that's part of the rent regulation package of laws. Why is that law there? I have no idea. There's no good reason for it. If you get rid of that, you start to protect so many uh, existing rent-stabilized units. We're so obsessed with new buildings, new construction, new construction, but we're losing some of the already existing rent-stabilized units. So that's just an example of one thing that could be done very easily. But uh, in terms of interpersonal stuff, you know, I, I think it's... Um, the thing I hear from people in neighborhoods, uh, especially with a lot of home, home ownership, uh, like Bed-Stuy um, in, in East New York and Cypress Hills, is uh, that new people in the neighborhood don't interact with uh, people who have been in the neighborhood. So it's about, you know, they don't say hello. And there's a lot of like southern hospitality in a lot of these neighborhoods. There's a lot of feeling of, of neighborliness. Uh, and, and so people, if you're new in a neighborhood, I think the best thing you can do is get to know your neighbors and to start to learn about the neighborhood. 
a lot of new arrivals come out of neighborhood with so many great ideas. This is what we want to do to the schools. This is what we want to do to the bodega. Uh, uh, don't come at the neighborhood with all your ideas. Listen to the people that have been in the neighborhood about what's been going on and what the existing challenges are. Um, I think that's a really good thing. And, and you know, as a gentrifier, you know, you, you, I can say that you have this feeling where you're like, uh, where I'm thinking I'm guilty, I'm, I feel bad. And I think you have to move past that. I interviewed a woman for the podcast in last week's episode, and she made a very good point about this. She's like, if you're feeling guilty as a gentrifier, you're, 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 you're being selfish about the situation. You're putting yourself at the middle of the drama. Mm -hmm. Like, get past yourself and get engaged. Find ways to get engaged in your community. That can happen at a community board meeting. That can happen at the YMCA. That can happen at a school. That can happen at a bar. It can happen in a lot of different places, formally and informally. But uh, get involved. Uh, get past those sort of initial feelings of guilt. Yes. Hi, so just a question. Sure. Just to piggyback off of something that I, I can't remember, DW, whether it was in that podcast or in your book, just a narrative of this woman who had lived in bed for a while. And one of her comments was, you know, I, I would love a nice espresso place. You know, it's that idea of increased yeah. amenities for all. And this is kind of throwing out a question that everybody, whether if you rack your brains, you can think of an example of something where it's, you know, the tide rises and all of the boats rise with it. You know, an, an urban metropolis in history um, that, you know, kind of worked in that way. And what was so different and extraordinary about that? I've always thought yachts have a ten tendency to rise and rafts sink. <laughs> I don't know how that one goes. Well put, well put. <laughs> I mean, there are examples in the 60s of new arrivals and locals organizing to get changes done to a school. I mean, I, 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 I don't, there are examples of possibilities of cooperation. You know, in the 70s, these people starting a lot of block associations. Um, community garden movement had a lot of mix of sort of hipsters and, you know, Puerto Rican activists. And, you know, it was, uh, I mean, I think they're, you know, I. I I think there there are examples of you know uh, you know of, co of cooperation, and not every new development is necessarily horrific for people who are there. I mean, I think DW is pointing out that when you actually are on the ground talking to all the actors involved, people tend to have ambivalence about what's changing, um, and that's what I was sort of saying that rather trying to tease out who are the winners and losers, you know, who are uh, there are three homeowners who sold for a killing before people who are displaced is that you sort of think about more generally about um, what's the city that we want. I mean, I know it sounds very ethereal, but um, I think the person who asked the question is right. I mean, you know, Detroit needs some investment. But how do you do that without displacing people is a major issue. How do you do it that recognizes the history of institutional racism that's overcoming that? That's, I mean, these are really serious conversations that we have to have, but, I mean, you can't embalm a place. You're not going to, you know, dip it in wax. Places have to change in a way that's just, though, and that benefits people who are already there. I mean, that, that, that is an interesting question because there are cities, of course, that, that um, are not being gentrified, really. And, and uh, what, do, what do we do about that? I mean, I live, um, I live right on the most. border of Newark, most, right. and, yeah. and, you know, Newark desperately needs, you know, improved services and everything else, but there isn't really a, much of an issue of gentrification there. So it's either too much in one place or not enough in another, you know. Um, so what do citizens of those cities do? I mean, you have to take part in your community and do all the things you're talking about, but it seems like there's even less chance of them making changes there. I don't know. Yes. <laughs> I always think of, um, well, and Newark is uh, an example of this in a way, like you know, cities that attract um, the writers and the artists and the people who, in some respects, have um, elected um, to live below median um, income level, right? So, like Newark offering the free MFA um, is this little glimmer of like, oh, okay, there are going to be a bunch of like artists moving into New York, Newark and making it a home for a while, or Detroit having that program with the, um, 
you can live in this house right for a house. free for a year if you yeah. do community stuff and art about the. You get the house forever. Forever. Mm -hmm. Well. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know that's a big that's a big question in my mind is to what extent are writers and artists. Um, kind of leeching and displacing, and to what extent are they um, helping to build a kind of um, attentiveness to different communities? Oh man, I think that relates to the um, discussion of people who make art versus people who can like consume art. Consume art. Um, not that artists don't consume art, but I do think, um, and this is something that I talk about a lot um, with the friends that I have. I have. Um, my friend Casey Rochetto was the first person to receive a house via a uh, right house. Um, but I was staying actually in another artist um, they've, in the West Villages, which is like an area in uh, Detroit. They've rehabbed a house um, there. And I was just thinking the thing that happens is that they make things look nice and interesting, but in 10 years they may not be able to afford to live there. Like themselves um, because uh, like you said a lot of them they've figured out ways to sort of live below um, below maybe the medium income and they are um, kind of creating community and a lot of it is not necessarily gen generating a lot of capital but it's making things seem more appealing I don't know <laughs> um, but I, I do think that it, that those sort of trends end up with the artists also being displaced in a lot of those cases We have time for one more question. Anyone? Well, I have some unasked questions, so um, let's see. Um, Suleiman, this is this is mostly for you, but but please, anyone chime in. Um, in your book, you you notice that. Um, that many of the names of gentrified Brooklyn neighborhoods kind of harken back to a pastoral history, <laughs> Cobble Hill, Carroll Gardens, Park Slope, and that those names were added later, that they weren't there originally. And uh, I wonder, you know, what role does nostalgia play in this? Where are, we, are we yearning for something that really wasn't there when, when we um, uh, try to, when, when people gentrify a neighborhood or whatever? Yeah, the, 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 I was describing in the 60s how a lot of these neighborhoods that were before the term existed were gentrifying. A lot of the, neighbor, the neighborhood names of Brownstone, Brooklyn, the term Brownstone, Brooklyn is really from the early 70s. And a lot of the names were coined in the 60s by these new arrivals. So Cobble Hill, Borm Hill, um, and some ways to try to, uh, Carroll Gardens, um, that they're invented, although all neighborhood names were invented. So you go back to the 1890s and you see these big debates about, right. is this place called Prospect Hill or is it called Park Hill? Like, you know, there's never really, um, but I just think this fascinating history of neighborhood names. Nostalgia is tough because I, I, I struggle with it because I struggle with my own nostalgia. And some ways I'm very critical of nostalgia because it's nostalgia. <laughs> and then there's some people like, well, maybe nostalgia can be a healthy counter to the destructive rhetoric of modernization, like maybe there's a way of almost revolutionary nostalgia to some extent, like a lot of revolutionary movements have an element of nostalgia, but I think, uh, you know, how, did, how does one become critical of nostalgia, especially when it was this type of nostalgia for, in this case, was often, um, oh, before the neighborhood, um, before the Great Migration, before African Americans moved here was this golden age and we're restoring it. Um, but anyway, the point is, I think nostalgia is interesting, the role of nostalgia in cities, both as a progressive and reactionary um, impulse. Um, I don't think you should get rid of nostalgia. So I don't know. I think about it a lot, memory in cities, and how do you grapple with retaining memory in a way that's progressive. All right, well, we're just about out of time. I hope um, you've enjoyed the discussion. There will be copies of all the books by these authors for sale afterwards, and you can also join us for a glass of wine. So thank you very much for coming out. Please uh, give a hand to our distinguished panel.